this talk. Yeah, yeah I thought I'd do it ahead of time just in case. <laughs> Hey, Coach Lowe, can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you? Good. We'll get started. Okay, I want to just welcome all media to Super Bowl 55 media availability with assistant defensive line coach Lori Lucas. Um, we'll get started. First question will come from Brooke Pryor. Hi, Brooke. Hey, Coach Lowe. We just finished talking with MJ. I was in MJ Zoom right before this, um, and she mentioned, you know, she looks forward to the day when being a woman coach is not newsworthy. And it is significant that you guys are not the first female coaches in the Super Bowl that Katie did at first. What is that like for you to have done so many firsts, but now kind of continue this? And how do you guys, the, the small group of female coaches, how do you support each other while you're being the firsts in so many things? Gotcha. I think, um, I think the nice thing about all of us right now is that that kind of title doesn't matter. Um, you know, we're, we're here to, uh, you know, MJ and I are here to help Tampa Bay win. Uh, it wouldn't matter if we're second in or 273rd in, you know what I mean? Like we acknowledge the fact there hasn't been many before us, uh, but it's not anything that we kind of keep in the forefront of what we do on a daily basis. So that's sort of, I guess, not a consideration when we're coaching, uh, and, Katie uh, and Jennifer King and I uh, have remained pretty close over the last couple of years, uh, reaching out to one another, asking questions. Uh, and this was way before, you know, I was hired uh, in Tampa. So I think that where the guys have it sort of automatically uh, in the coaching tree, you know, uh, I coached with him at this college. He and I played high school ball together and they sort of have that automatic connection um, ours has to be built. So it's been nice to be on the forefront of the building of the framework for the rest of the women coaches that are going to be coming in uh, behind us. And uh, it's just, you know, it's something where it's natural and it's kind of organic. So we don't really make a big deal out of it. But it is nice sometimes to talk to somebody who understands you just a little bit better. But the guys have that already too. So and do you feel that the, the framework that you guys are building right now, I mean, are you guys becoming aware of other female coaches that are coming up in the ranks? Are you having questions or getting questions from them saying, you guys did it. How can I do it? How can I follow in your steps? Sure. Yeah. I mean, and, and we look for opportunities. I know I look for opportunities to mentor whenever possible, but you have to understand it, there's a blessing and a curse to media coverage in regards to women coaches, because what it looks like sometimes is that we've just sprung up out of nowhere, whereas there's hundreds of women that are at various levels of football, whether at high school, college, semi-pro, and they've been out there kind of doing it on their own, and they've been earning those positions on their own without any help from anyone else. Um, where this starts to take shape is uh, the pipeline that Sam Rappaport has just championed and put together with the NFL the women's forums that she has uh, constructed over the last few years has put head coaches and GMs and lead scouting department people in front of some very, very viable, young, promising, talented women that I feel if COVID hadn't hit, you would have seen so many more women uh, in the league this year, uh, whether internships or straight hires. Um, I think that it's just shining a light now back on the women that are already out there. But yeah, I mean, I get questions all the time and from young men also, uh, because we're all kind of striving to do the same job in the same workplace. And if I can provide any help to them, you know, I certainly answer questions when I can. Next, we'll go to Lindsay Jones. Hi, Lindsay. I think I'm unmuted here now. Um, I just was going to follow up a little bit on what you were telling one of your answers to Brooke about kind of the relationship that you and Jennifer King and Katie and MJ have. How does that kind of, and, and probably Callie, and there's probably women all mm -hmm. around me, um, what ways does that manifest itself? Is it group text? Is it dinners at the combine when that is something that is allowed to happen? Um, and what are some of the, the things that you guys talk about when it's just the female coaches together? Um, you know, I know we do that with the women in, the, in our side, on our side, but yeah, 
what those group texts look like on your side? Um, it is pretty much group text now, obviously because of COVID, uh, and because, you know, when you're working, you know, we all understand each other's schedules. So, um, I think it's really nice because we support each other unconditionally. Um, we may talk a little bit of trash, just a little bit when we're playing one another, but (laughs) it, it doesn't, uh, it never gets malicious. Uh, but, you know, certainly throughout the season this year, you know, we were all wishing each other luck, like on game day, or, you know, if there was anything, you know, messages of, of encouragement as you go into like a tougher game, I think it's so unassuming and so supportive that it's like refreshing because we all understand the challenges of the workday. We understand, you know, what the hours are. And I think that it's just been a really unencumbered type of professional relationship that you would want in any workplace. Uh, we did have a dinner at the combine. That was kind of nice. And, you, you know, oddly enough, we talk about football. <laughs> we don't get into specifics, obviously, of like game planning and personnel and things like that. But, you know, we, we have that commonality. You know, we played the game. Um, I played a lot earlier than those guys did. But, you know, we talk about playing. We talk about the teams we talk about what you talk about as any other type of football coach and then you know sometimes you know kids come into it with my kids and sometimes you know you talk about you know other stuff that's just relative but it's not unlike I think if you sat down uh with any male coaches and asked them the same question next we'll go to Teresa Walker hi Teresa uh, hi, Lori. I uh, wanted to talk about, a little bit about that pipeline. Uh, it, the one thing that I know being a woman sports writer is, you know, getting in touch with others. How tough yeah. is it for, uh, you know, for you women to find each other, help support each other, or, or you know, a- answer the kind of questions that women know that you can ask another woman that you can't maybe ask another guy? Right. So before the pipeline uh, was put into existence through the forums, and we're talking now, I think it's four years since the very first one uh, that was put together, you know, it felt very isolating at times uh, to be doing what I was doing. Uh, I thought I was making the right steps. I really didn't have someone other than my male colleagues that I could ask about, you know, job tracking and, you know, where to go next and try to make common sense decisions on my own. But it's so much more valuable when you're sitting in a room and you're of like-minded individuals and you can start to connect with other women. Uh, And again, I think that the way that this has been put together with the league and with Sam, it's very non-competitive when you're sitting with that same table of women. You're not all vying for the same positions type of mentality, but you're gathering the information in order to take back to where you're at currently and say, okay, so I know what I need to do next now, right? Like there's, there's a framework that's been provided. Whereas before you might just like I did, you know, I knew I wanted to work for this semi pro team. I knew I wanted to not work for that one. I know I wanted to work for this arena team and I didn't want to work for that one. Now you have viable steps and you have people that you can reach out to, to ask those type of questions. You know, if I do this, what about that? If I go here, then what about this? It's so valuable and it's something we've been lacking, but now that it's in place, I do feel like you're going to see a lot more qualified candidates being brought to the table. And hopefully the teams like Tampa Bay has set the example for, will start to look at candidates regardless of gender or color and really start to broaden their talent pool. Next, we'll go to Blair Tote. Hi, this is Blair Tate from the BBC. Hi, Blair. So we've touched on it a little bit with the diversity that Coach Arians has brought to the Buccaneers. Um, so it's not just women, it's a lot of, I mean, there's race, there's gender, there's experience, whether it be career coaches, whether it be players. How do you think this has benefited the Buccaneers? I mean, we know diversity is so important, but can you give me an example too of how this has been put in practice, how important this is to the team itself? Well, um, I think a good result is to say that we're playing on Sunday. Um, but I think that it's just, you have to understand this is not something that's done because of checking boxes. It's not done because of an initiative. It's who BA is and has always been. So I think that that's why it works so well here is that he's gathered individuals that he knows will benefit the organization. 
He has talent. He has people he can trust around him. And it doesn't matter what we look like. He's put together that staff because it's people that he feels will help the team win. And clearly that combination has worked. Um, But I, I do think it starts at the top. It starts with our ownership. It starts with BA um, and just choices and his freedom to make those type of choices has been invaluable. And like I said, obviously it, it's working and hopefully it'll set an example for the rest of the league to kind of take notice and stop, you know, being maybe so narrow in their candidate search. Next we'll go to Mari Fail. Hey coach Lowe, how are you doing today? Hi hon, how are you? Doing well. Um, I hope that you can kind of just take me back to Sunday night, um, the emotions that you were feeling after the win and who's the first person that you had that interaction with that is just forever cemented in your brain. And then um, obviously coming home, coming out of the airport and seeing hundreds of Bucks fans waiting for you guys outside the gates. Like, can you just talk me through that night a little bit? Sure. I mean, it's always so special, you know, to see those fans that wait so long for our planes to get back. Uh, my sons are always the first people that I'll call and touch base with after a game. Um, it's important to me to keep that type of sort of close contact. Um, they mean the world to me. They're my whys for what I do. And uh, so they'll both get the call and a little bit of a conversation. Um, you have to understand it's I compartmentalized so much that I was so happy that we won. But at the same point in my mind, I'm calculating, you know, what time we'll get back, what time I have to try and get into the office the next day, still have to grade the film, still have to, you know, start our meetings. Everything has remained consistent throughout. So it's not like you really have that, you know, wow, at least I don't, you know, because I'm thinking the next game already and I'm thinking, you know, what we have to do in order to prepare for it what my role is in, you know, getting that preparation stuff together. Um, so I kind of live by like a 10 minute rule. Um, if I'm, you know, totally upset about something, I give myself 10 minutes to get over it. If I'm so excited about something, I get 10 minutes to celebrate and then I got to move on because there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of prep stuff, uh, that, that has to go on. Hopefully after the season, I'll get a chance to kind of sit back and reflect, but right now, um, you know, we're singularly focused and um, I'm part of that process. Next, we'll go to Nate Davis. Hey coach, thanks for the time. Hey, um, Nate. Um, I wanted to ask you, we, we love to ask young players about their welcome to the NFL moment. Um, I, I didn't know maybe if you had one of those and if, if your perspective as a woman altered that. And, and then kind of secondly, uh, how is it different and whether you're a woman or not, you know, um, perspective wise, working with great players like JPP and Dom can sue. And maybe how is it not different at all, you know, from coaching players at lower levels? Yeah. Um, great questions. So um, you're talking about welcome to the league, like when they get hit really hard, <laughs> like those type of welcome to the, to the league rookie kind of things. Um, I didn't have one of those yet. Knock on wood. Uh, certainly. I think uh, what I will say is that you don't know what you don't know. And obviously, you know, I am around uh, a lot of experienced coaches. So just being able to try and stay up with all of the things that come so automatically to them, I think has been, you know, my biggest point of emphasis to try and get better as a coach. Um, I still have a long way to go. You know, I can't catch up with these guys in a season or two, but I think just trying to kind of stay where Um, My lane is in regards to being an assistant coach to learn to continue to work with Coach Rogers and work within Coach Bowles system. Um, I think that that's sort of been my intro to it. Um, A lot of studying on my part, uh, for sure. And uh, this year, obviously, feeling a lot more solid with things. So um, that's always good. And then as far as the players go, you know, I've always tried to look at a guy individually. Um, not really by the contract uh, size that he has, but just coach him within the scheme or within the assignment. So the guys are great. They're all really respectful. They're all really good to work with. They're very coachable. 
And uh, it hasn't really um, hasn't really struck me like one over the other for players. Um, I just I'm I'm glad to be around them and have the ability to coach them on a daily basis. Next, we'll go to Daniel Gallon. Hey, Lori, uh, Daniel Gallon from Penn Live. Um, Hi, Daniel. You know, when you look back at your time at, you know, Susquehanna Township High School, you know, in central Pennsylvania, kind of the start of everything. Sure. What are what are some of the lessons from back then or things that you learned that have really, you know, continued to carry on, you know, up to this point in the Super Bowl? Sure. Hard work. Um, no job is, you know, beneath you. Uh, you know, when you work for different sizes of schools back in PA, you know, some have resources and some don't. And, uh, you know, I was at Susquehanna for almost nine seasons, never got paid, um, never asked to get paid, um, did everything that I could to learn there, um, did every job that sometimes the guys maybe didn't want to do, um, because I knew that it would help kind of round out my experience uh, as a coach, um, did stuff with the youth league, I was on the JV team uh, coaching staff, and then I'd go right to varsity program. And this was all around working uh, two jobs and trying to raise uh, my boys. So um, just kind of like the work ethic behind it, seeing what all was going to be needed. And even then uh, still taking that amplified times 10 to be here. I think it was just a good foundation uh, to this progression, you know, of my career. Next, we'll go to Grace Remington. Hi, Coach Lowe. Um, I have Hi, two questions. Um, first, I remember I first saw you in Birmingham, and it's been a crazy two years going from right. that. Now you're full-time assistant position coach. Now you're in the Super Bowl. Have you had time or do you even want to take a step back to reflect on it? And then second, um, I don't know how much you got to see Vita Vea during his rehab process, but you're out there with him in practice. And um, I was wondering if you could speak to just how remarkable that recovery is in 15 weeks yeah I mean from uh from a taking it in standpoint not yet um after next week um hopefully I'll have some time to sit back and reflect on it but I think that again we're so singularly focused all the time on the game plan and just you know the next game and being prepared for it and we've tried to keep really as normal as we can um, all of last week with the game prep and our meetings and, you know, being with the guys. And then, you know, this week we'll try and hold it to that same type of schedule. Um, so not yet, um, hopefully at some point. Um, and yeah, I mean, beat is incredible. He, he's an incredible athlete. Um, we're so glad that he's back. Um, but I know he's worked so hard to get through that injury and uh, obviously we're looking forward to see, you know, the addition of putting him back in um, now that he's even a couple more weeks healthier uh, for the big game. Next, we'll go to Luke Easterling. Hey, Coach, how you doing? Hi, Luke, how are you? I'm doing well. You, you know, you mentioned earlier about, you know, working with players as it, result, as it relates to the scheme or, or an assignment. I remember talking to Will Golston earlier this year and just talking about how much fun he was having in this defense. Mm -hmm. What's it like to be able to, to coach in, in, in coach Bowles, the scheme and, and the versatility and, and all the different things that this defense can throw at it as a coach. What's it like to be able to, to coach to that scheme? It's like uh, how many toys can you put in your toy box uh, <laughs> kind of uh, attack on an offense? No, I think that, um, I mean, Coach Bowles is amazing, you know, the way that he can scheme an offense uh, and we can bring pressure the way that we do and incorporate so many different players in those packages has been incredible to watch and to learn from. And uh, the fundamentals, obviously, you know, with Coach Rogers and how he builds the players' football IQs up has allowed them to play even smarter and faster. So it's just, it's a phenomenal process to watch and uh, even better process to be a part of. Next, we'll go back to Hannah Wilkes. Hi, Laurie, um, great to speak to you. Um, it's been so interesting hearing about your 
sort of coaching journey, your coaching story. For you personally, you know, someone who didn't start playing football until, you know, in her 40s and the coaching career has kind of been your, your second act. Can you sum up what it means to you to be competing in a Super Bowl on Sunday? I mean, obviously it's, it's something that's the pinnacle of uh, where we're at. And um, it seems so big from the outside looking in, uh, but I just, I don't think that I've allowed myself to sort of really embrace the whole impact of what this really means. And I don't know that I'll do it until after the game. Uh, It's just something that I've always done to sort of compartmentalize bigger things in my life, this probably being the biggest uh, of my career, Uh, but it's just not anything I want to let get sort of out ahead of me and, you know, really kind of take over where we're at. We have things we have to do to be ready. And we have uh, a lot of meetings and review that still needs to be done. So um, I don't look at things personally as much as I look at them for the team um, I've always kind of said, you know, it's not about me, it's about we. So I don't get very introspective often, but hopefully I will take some time uh, next week to, uh, to do that. Next, we'll go to Joel Smith. Hey, Lori, hello from Central PA. We're Hi, Joel. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back a little bit. Um, when did you first think about coaching? Was it in high school? Um, how did that actually happen? Yeah, so uh, it's ironic that you say that. The high school football coach at Susquehanna when I was in high school uh, was one of the, the last probably hardcore, hard-nosed uh, football coaches, grab guys by their face masks, you know, yell, spit, all the things you're not supposed to, to do anymore. Um, and I had a job on the football team because he knew how much I liked football. Um, so I would on Friday nights, I would be the runner, uh, and I would, uh, stand next to him or the defensive coordinator and I would get the play and I would run to the clipboard and the clipboard was always where the ball was at. So I got a lot of cardio on Friday nights. Um, but it was so cool that he allowed me to be that close to the game. Um, and memorized all the hand signals, you know, from the defensive coordinator, you know, it was just, it was a phenomenal opportunity, but that's kind of like where it stopped. It just allowed me to be that close. And then when the team came to Harrisburg, uh, when I was turning 40 and I decided to play, I just wanted to play football. Um, it was incredible. It was NFL rule. Uh, we got bumps and bruises and I've had few surgeries uh, because of playing the game of football. But the last one, uh, the last injury kind of took me out of commission and I didn't want to be away from the game. So they allowed me to kind of coach the women's team. And that's when I kind of got bit by that bug. You know, other than that, I would have still been playing. Had I not gotten hurt, I don't know that I would be sitting here in front of you guys um, because I just... It was just something that I always wanted to do. And it was a great group of women. Some of my best friends are my teammates. Um, As you can imagine, that happens on the women's side as well. So um, it was sort of a late uh, epiphany that I also wanted to coach. And um, once I decided to go into it a little bit more full time, that's when things really got rolling. And I think that's why I'm here now today. All right. That's all we have time for. Appreciate you taking the time, coach. Thanks, guys. Have a good day.